Hi, everybody. I'm sitting here in a hotel in Brussels where I am for a meeting. And I will record my talk for you for Cosmology at Home. Uh, hope you are all at home, comfortable in a chair and listening to, my, uh, to the story I have to tell about the dipole. I think it's really exciting. Hope you like it. The title of my talk is Test of the Copernican Principle, of the Cosmological Principle, by measuring our peculiar velocity and the large scale anisotropy independently. This is work I did together with a master's student, Tobias, and my colleagues, Martin Kuntz and Hamza Padmanabhan. I shall start with an introduction and then introduce the concept of weighted number counts and explain to you how this can be used to measure both the intrinsic and the kinematic dipole independently. Then I want to apply it to real surveys and forecast the accuracy which these surveys can achieve measuring our uh, applying our method to measure the kinematic and intrinsic dipole. <clears throat> As you all know, the dipole from the cosmic microwave background has been measured very accurately. The first measurements go back to the 1970s and the present measurement, if we interpret this as our peculiar velocity with respect to the CMB large, uh, large scattering surface, gives a velocity of about 370 kilometers per second. And look at the accuracy. If we assume the entire dipole is due to this velocity, we can measure the velocity in the precision of, about, of roughly one kilometer, per, uh, one meter per second. <clears throat> it's highly accurate. And one of the, if not the most precise number which we have in cosmology. Also, the directions of this dipole are very well known. This dipole is also consistent with the modulation and aberration of the higher multiples of the CMB temperature fluctuation as measured by Planck. They have been measured with not quite three sigma. Um, <clears throat> significance, 2.8, I think, if I remember correctly, but they are consistent with this velocity. We did now standard model of cosmology, lambda CDM. We expect that our velocity with respect to the last scattering surface of the CMB should actually agree with our velocity with respect to the matter distribution on very large scales. <coughs> but somehow this seems not to be the case. People have tried to measure this velocity and so far it has never agreed with the result from the CMB. Typically, the direction is roughly compatible, but the amplitude is about the factor of two or more larger. The first people I remember who have measured this were Lauer and Postman, and also they found a value of like a thousand kilometers per second instead of what, what, it, what the CMB finds. That was in the 90s, back in the 90s. Now, uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so, mainly radio surveys like NBSS, but also others have been used to determine the dipole. And they got values <clears throat> which were always too large. All of these papers, you can look at them. Lately, also quasars have been used. And the most recent result, by Sekeres et al. from 2022 combines quasars and radio galaxies <coughs> sorry, and finds about the 5.2 sigma discrepancy from the CMB, while the quasar and radio dipoles roughly agree 
all these analysis of the radio galaxies and quasars use a, a relation which we shall uh, briefly discuss below by Baldwin and Ellis, which relates the dipole D here to the peculiar velocity. These are two phenomenological parameters which I shall discuss shortly. Uh, it is assumed that these phenomenological parameters which are measured in the data are constant. And it has been shown actually by relaxing this assumption, if one allows these parameters to depend on redshift, one can in principle reconcile the observations with the, roughly with the CMB dipole. Nevertheless, in this latest paper here, Sekres et al have used quasars and have used radio galaxies for which two classes of objects for which these parameters X and alpha are different and get the same discrepancy for both of them. So <clears throat> that in both cases, the evolution with the redshift of these parameters might make might, might uh, reconcile the results with the CMP seems less likely, but yeah, this is just a caveat. So apart from these interpretation errors, which might be there, or measurement errors, which are also always possible, there are two other possibilities, uh, uh, two other conclusions which we can draw from this <clears throat> data. Both of them, I think, revolutionary. Namely, the rest frame of the CMB doesn't agree with the, one of the matter. So our motion, which is fixed, is different with respect to the CMB and with respect to the matter. So we measure different kinematic dipoles. Or that the intrinsic dipole is larger than what is predicted from lambda CDM. Since the intrinsic dipole with respect to the matter needn't be the same as the one with respect to the CMB, which is much further away from us or much earlier, they can have different intrinsic dipoles. In this talk, I describe a method, new method, to distinguish between the two dipoles, which will be because present measurements just measure a dipole, they don't know whether it is due to our motion or whether it is an intrinsic dipole in the matter distribution. They just see that they measure a dipole which doesn't agree with the CMB. <clears throat> we expect the angular distribution of sources around us on very large scales integrated over a considerable redshift range to exhibit the dipole to our motion, which we call the kinematic dipole, which is due to our motion with respect to these sources. But we cannot forget that the, that the sources are clustered and this clustering will also generate the dipole, the so-called number count dipole, which may be small, but we, we can calculate it. And who knows, maybe uh, we are mistaken. We actually live in a Bianchi universe and not in a Friedman universe. And uh, our geometry has an intrinsic dipole. We shall call the combination of such a geometric and clustering dipole, the intrinsic dipole. <clears throat> As we have already said, the CMB dipole is very well measured. And if we, um, attributed entirely to our peculiar velocity. The peculiar velocity is about 10 to the minus three and also its orientation is very well known. We, uh, according to standard lambda CDM, there should be an intrinsic part also in this dipole, but the intrinsic part should be about a hundred times smaller. So in the number we five, six digits, which I have shown on the first slide or a few slides, slides ago, this intrinsic dipole should also be contained and should come roughly in the third dates, you know, or something like that. But the dominant 
bulk part should be due to the kinematic type. <coughs> now let us consider number counts. If we count sources around us, they are also affected. This count is also affected with, with respect to our motion. Uh, with respect to the mean distribution of uh, um, velocity of the background universe. On the one hand, the solid angle changes in different directions, right? By uh, if, if I'm moving in a given direction, the solid angle becomes smaller. This is shown by this factor one minus two beta times n. On the other hand, sources get blue shifted. So I see their spectra. If I measure in a given frequency band, I see a slightly bluer part of their spectra if they come towards us. And also the flux is scaled. <clears throat> I get uh, a somewhat higher flux. If I take this all together, I get a formula which was first derived by Ellis and Baldwin in 1984, <clears throat> which tells me that if the flux scales with the power uh, minus x at the flux limit of my survey, and if the frequency dependence of, my, of the flux goes like nu to the minus alpha in the vicinity of the observed frequency, then I actually get a number of objects, which is which has a dipole due to the change of flux and the change of frequency and the change of solid angle, which is 2 plus x times 1 plus alpha times n beta, where beta is the peculiar velocity, our peculiar velocity. For typical radio galaxies, x is of order unity and alpha is about 0.75. <clears throat> Putting these together, we obtain a kinematical dipole of 4.6, 10 to the minus three. If we assume the CMB velocity, which is 1.2, 10 to the minus three. This factor is not quite, it's nearly four, but not exact. 3.75. <clears throat> So that's the dipole which we should see in the same direction as the CMB if we see the kinematical dipole. Observations, however, have seen a dipole which is typically double as much, double that, which is 10 to minus two or close to 10 to minus two instead of 4.6, 10 to minus three in a, direction which broadly agrees with, <clears throat> with the CMB direction, but with large errors. Now let us look at the intrinsic dipole from clustering only, Clus uh, number count. We are using class, linear perturbation theory should be enough for the dipole, that's very large scale fluctuations. And we start with a minimal, if we start with a minimal redshift of 10 to, uh, of 0 0.1, we obtain typically a dipole, <clears throat> intrinsic dipole of about 10 to the minus three. If we start with a minimal redshift and go out to a maximal redshift of uh, three here, or if we go to a maximal redshift of two, dipole is a bit larger, et cetera, et cetera. If we start with a larger minimal velocity, we have a somewhat smaller dipole, and but still, if we go out to redshift 1.2 or even 2, we still remain in the vicinity of about 10 to the minus 3 for the dipole. So this is a first, I think, interesting and relevant result that we do expect an intrinsic dipole from number counts or four to 10 to the minus three, maybe a little bit smaller, but not much smaller, depending a bit on the configuration we have been uh, considering. I mean, the survey redshift limits and other stuff. This depends, of course, on slightly on the bias, and etc. 
shot noise also induces an angular uh, uh, a dipole. The shot noise power spectrum is simply uh, the inverse of the number density of sources. So if you have n toad sor sources and the sky fraction x chi, the number density of sources is given by n toad over 4 pi x chi. And the uh, shot noise dipole is just one over n bar. So <clears throat> if you have a full sky, you expect a dipole from shot noise, which is three over square root n tot. So for a million uh, uh, sources, that's the typical number for radio surveys is actually a million. You expect a shot noise contribution to the dipole, which is roughly the same as the kinematical dipole, which you expect if the CMB is the right thing. That's also something not to forget about. But there is this huge shot noise if you have only a million sources. I mean, uh, the Abel, cluster, uh, Abel clusters by Lauer and Postman, I think they had a thousand or something like that. Probably even less. <clears throat> so actually, if the sky coverage is partial, you get leakage from higher multipoles into the dipole, so that if you make a naive analysis, your dipole actually still remains roughly three over square root and top. We have tested that and have found that there is this leakage, which is which makes it more or less always this. So what have we seen? The total dipole from number counts has a piece which is the kinematic dipole, which we also see in the CMB, but then it has an intrinsic dipole, which is typically much bigger than the one in the CMB, namely a factor of 100 bigger. And it has a shot noise dipole, which depends on the number of sources. But if you have a million sources, the shot noise and the kinematic dipole are comparable. In a given survey, that's your uh, number count. In a given uh, per angular bin, you just sum <coughs> the, your galaxies which you have in your catalog, which is cut by some flux limit, size, angular size limit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you get a mean density plus a dipole plus higher multipoles, which we neglect in our analysis here. We are only interested in the dipole. Now, instead of just counting objects, sources, we could also multiply them with some function of observed properties of the sources, like flux, redshift, angular size, etc. If we know exactly how these sources <clears throat> behave under a boost, we can use this fact to know how our number density changes under a velocity. And of course, of all these quantities, we know exactly how they change under a boost. So with such a weight, we obtain the weighted number count. That's what we call a weighted number count. If we use such a function, weight function, which we will um, <coughs> we will uh, make examples of in the next slide. Let me just move this again. Now, if uh, in the kinematic dipole will contain the velocity with some weight bw, while, the, while in the number density we also know it is present with the weight bn, which we have discussed before, which was what, 2 plus 1 times uh, 2 plus x times 1 plus alpha. That's the bn. 
and the BW depends on our choice of this function, which we will discuss. <coughs> what is interesting, however, is that if we consider in this whited dipole, assuming that the, the intrinsic properties of the sources are not correlated within uh, with the uh, intrinsic dipole, with the clustering dipole, or the uh, anisotropy of the geometry, this intrinsic dipole is independent on this, of this white function. It just drops out if it is properly normalized. And therefore, if we look at n minus nw, the intrinsic dipole drops out. We, of course, we still have the shot noise, and we will have to determine what the weight of uh, the shot noise exactly is. <coughs> if we multiply the weighted dipole with the weight of the number counts and the number counts with the weight of the weighted dipole, and we take this difference, then the kinematical dipole drops actually out, and we can measure the intrinsic dipole. So the beta will become the difference of the number count uh, of the weighted dipole minus intrinsic dipole divided by the weights. <clears throat> While the intrinsic dipole, there I must multiply the number counts with the white of the whited dipole with the prefact of the whited dipole, while I must mul multiply the whited dipole with the prefactor of the number count to get the intrinsic dipole. <coughs> These uh, white factors, PW and PN, can in principle also determine directly from the data, we can just boost each data point. We know its property. We know how the properties change under, uh, under a boost. And we can correspondingly change our weight function. And this gives us, this just gives us the, uh, forward and backward number, uh, Weighted number counts. And PW is then just the difference of the forward minus the backward <clears throat> divided by the sum. Sorry, sorry, this should be the sum. What I've written here is a bit trivial. Divided by the velocity, there is this two from the d omega, from the solid angle. Sorry, this should be a plus sign. Here I show for LSST and Euclid, and for SKA, prop the properties which we shall use. We shall use redshift and magnitude for LSST and Euclid, and we propose weight functions which are just powers of these quantities. And here I show the number density of these objects here as density plots, and here as functions for red and blue galaxies. So <clears throat> you see the redshift of the blue galaxies, and here you see their magnitude distribution. And here the corresponding plot for SKA for star forming galaxies and AGNs in blue and red. And again, you see the size of the galaxies, size distribution of galaxies, and the flux distribution because that will be the properties which we shall use. And <clears throat> now we made the simulation to find what are the best weights to use, which give us the highest signal to noise. And then we uh, simulated how well can we reconstruct beta from these best weights. So let me take you through this explain you how we did this, what we, what we did exactly. <clears throat> 
So we calculated the number count fluctuations with class hell of it using a bias factor and the, uh, evolution and S from Alonso et al for LSST. At this point, the only distinction which we made between LSST and Euclid is the sky coverage. So it's a bit, <clears throat> and the number of galaxies. So it's a bit approximate. Then we produced the Gaussian realization of the sky using the sky coverage of the experiment or the full sky. We wanted to compare how the two, how the two differ. Then we Poisson sampled this sky with the corresponding distribution of magnitudes and redshifts <clears throat> for uh, LSST and Euclid, or with the corresponding distribution of flux and size for SKA by fixing the total number of objects. <clears throat> Finally, we apply a boost with the CMB velocity on all these properties. And then we calculate the signal to noise for beta for different lighting exponents in order to determine the best whites. And by analyzing the resulting maps for the best whites, we calculate the dipole for N and NW and we determine the prefactors Bn and Bw by boosting a random sky with the properties <clears throat> of the data. With a large velocity around about 0.1 or so, it cannot be too large because this is a linear approximation, right? We linearize the dipole, must, be, must remain smaller than one or smaller than the in, induced uh, higher order contribution to it. That's what we find for the best right. You see that <clears throat> for LSST and Euclid, the best right wants a positive exponent for the magnitude and a, uh, a negative exponent for uh, the redshift. So the smaller the redshift, the higher the white. So the, the best fit is actually magnitude exponent 1.4 and the redshift exponent minus 3.3. <clears throat> For the SKA, we find a flux exponent, which is positive, the best value is 0.4. There is a near degeneracy line here, which would be interesting to understand. We kind of only speculated about it, but didn't find a good understanding. And the flux exponent of minus one. And here is uh, the accuracy with which we can determine the dipole from this. It's wherever we put it, it's in the way. <coughs> Uh, from these surveys. Uh, the black line is the theory. The black dots are full sky. The yellow dots are LSST and the blue dots are Euclid. Here on this <coughs> side, we show the results for beta, its error, and for the direction and its error, if only the number count, di dipole, count dipole is considered. And on this side, we show uh, what happens if you use the weighted approach. You see, if we use <clears throat> the number count dipole only, the error goes down to a certain amount and then it just sticks here as a function of the total number of of sources. While if we use our weighted approach, the intrinsic dipole is gone and does not affect the error, but and the error just goes down like one over square root n as it should if it is dominated by shot noise. 
with the direction it is similar, it can be much better determined if we use the our writing method than if we only use the number count dipole. <laughs> <clears throat> What we also see, especially for the direction, is that it is, of course, much better determined if we have full sky than if we have a cut sky. That's not very surprising, I guess. Here, the, the same plot for SKA. If we only use the number count dipole, <clears throat> or if we use the weighted approach, here we still, we, with the number count dipole included, we also get a relatively good result. And the reason for that is that the um, intrinsic dipole here is twice slower. And therefore, uh, the improvement is not as significant, but it would be more significant if we would have more objects. We see this here, for example, for the direction uh, or the error, right? Uh, roughly here at roughly uh, 3, 10 to the 7, the error gets better than. <coughs> And then uh, if, if in the weighted approach, then in the number count dipole. Let us look at the intrinsic dipole. This is new, can also be determined. In the cut sky that are the colored points, lines, we include leakage. If you have full sky, there is no leakage. This is really the intrinsic dipole, 10 to minus 3, for, <clears throat> for LSST and Euclid, and roughly half of that for SKA. And it can be rather well measured. Here we include leakage, then it's even larger and can be even better measured. And also the direction can be measured, yeah, not so well with quite significant scatter. But still, this just for, your, for uh, completeness, I show the partial sky coverage of LSST, Euclid and SKA. <clears throat> and you see SKA is, is a bit, the sky coverage is a bit small, the intrinsic dipole is also small, but also for Euclid, if sky coverage would be better, we could do more. Here we were also looking at measurement errors. We were just considering one example of a measurement error, which we think is probably the most relevant one in both cases. <coughs> For LSST and Euclid, we looked at redshift. Since we are considering um, photometric surveys, we expect the redshift error of about 0.05 or so, somewhere here. And we see that <clears throat> if a redshift error would be 0.1, this would have a very significant influence, especially as it leads to a systematic overestimation of the dipole. And if we have no redshift error at all, <clears throat> that's roughly equivalent to a redshift error of 10 to minus 3, which we will never achieve in a photometric survey, but also a few 10 to minus 2 is not so bad. So 5, 10 to minus 2, is actually not so bad. Here uh, for SKA, we were looking at the size error. If we have a size error of one arc second, that's just not good enough. We will get huge error bars. But if we have a size error of about the tenth of an arc second, then that's like no size error at all. Then the size error becomes subdominant <coughs> to the error and the offset, which is due to uh, shot noise. 
that's actually most of what I want to tell you. I, let, let me just stress again once the, uh, the final results. With LSST or Euclid, we will, with Euclid, we will probably have 10 to the nine galaxies. And if we take 10 to the nine and the uh, red, minimum redshift of 0.2, and the redshift error of about 5%, which we think is realistic, and the sky coverage as it is indicated, we can determine the kinematic dipole at the percent level, as well as its direction. The intrinsic dipole at the few percent level and the few degree, with a few degree its direction. Here, LSST and Euclid are similar. For SKA, we took 10 to the eight galaxies, uh, 10 to the eight because uh, we need to determine their size with a roughly 0.1 or point, uh, 0.1 arc, arc second precision. We allow for the smallest, uh, uh, the smallest galaxies, which we include, must have a size of 0.3 arc seconds. We assume that we can measure their precision with 0.1 arc second. We have a slightly higher sky coverage there. And the accuracy for beta is a few percent. <clears throat> for, uh, for the intrinsic dipole, it's not very good because the intrinsic dipole is smaller. But if we are uh, very optimistic and assume that we can measure all sizes, we have three times more galaxies and uh, the error bars go down somewhat. We should also add maybe a 2% systematic uncertainty to beta and to the intrinsic dipole. The leakage actually can be corrected for to some extent. Uh, we do not uh, uh, include leakage errors in these errors here. <laughs> With this, I come to my conclusion. The intrinsic dipole from large scale uh, clustering is typically 10 to the minus 3, not 10 to the minus 5 as we expect it to be for the CMB. Combining two or more observables, it is possible to isolate intrinsic and kinematic dipole. Good sky coverage is very important. Large number of objects is very important. 10 to the minus A should be, is required to get like 10% accuracy. With LSST and Euclid, we will be able to measure both kinematic and intrinsic dipole to a few percent accuracy in amplitude and a few degrees in direction. For SKA, prospects for the kinematic dipole are similar, but the intrinsic dipole will be less well measured because it is somewhat smaller. A new idea would be to apply this to also to higher moments, not only to the dipole, <clears throat> to higher moments in the number counts. This might allow us to break certain degeneracies which the number counts have, for example, for measuring cosmological parameters. That's all I wanted to say. I hope we will have a lively discussion when we meet online. And I wish you all a good evening. Goodbye.